Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I would like to welcome everybody to this uh, debate. I would like, to, first of all, to welcome our roundtable discussion panelists. I would like to welcome the, 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 the participants of the conference, our guests, and, the, uh, and, and, and guests who came only for this roundtable discussion, because as there are some people who came only for this event, let me uh, briefly explain what will be the formula of this, uh, of, of this event and uh, why we decided to organize this, uh, uh, this roundtable discussion. Even if it is not a roundtable, please imagine it is roundtable. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, the, the roundtable is organized in frames of an international conference, Memory and Religion, Central and Eastern Europe, in global perspective, which is organized in frames of Genealogies of Memory project. Uh, and uh, one more time, we would like to express our great attitude to Rafał Rogulski, the director of the uh, European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, to giving us the opportunity to organize this debate. Uh, to our discussion on memory and religion, we have invited five prominent guests, uh, representative of different religions. And now let me introduce these uh, people. So, uh, Pastor Thomas Junter came to us from Evangelical Reconciliation Parish in Berlin. Uh, then we have Father Archie, Archipriest Kiryu Kaleda. He came to us from the Church of the New Martyrs and Confessors of Russia in Butovo near Moscow. Uh, then I welcome priest Professor Piotr Mazurkiewicz, who is from the Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University in Warsaw. Uh, there is also Sufi Andrzej Saramowicz with us. He's uh, from the head of the Rumi <coughs> Foundation of Poland. And uh, Rabbi Joshua Elias uh, from Sheva Israel in Katowice and also uh, from, from Warsaw. So we are very <coughs> honored that you have agreed to participate in this uh, debate. And thank you very much for, for, for coming and uh, uh, agreeing to meet with us. And now uh, let me uh, explain how, what, how the debate will look like. So we decided to divide it into three parts. First, each panelist will have uh, 10 minutes uh, for the presentation of the commemorative work uh, of the memory project, or they will well, express, they, 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 uh, they will make the kind of lecture they, uh, the, about, uh, about the attitude to the, religi to the memory, uh, religious memory of uh, memory in their religions. Uh, after this presentation, Yuya and me, we will ask our guests some, uh, some questions. So during this uh, part, we will position ourselves as the memory researchers, and we would like to ask a few questions which we find crucial for, for memory studies. Uh, to better understand the maybe differences, similarities, to better also understand the way, uh, <coughs> what differs our approaches. Uh, and finally, there will be time for a common discussion. So please remember that after the, 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 the presentations, you will not have the time for, for quick uh, um, uh, questions. So please note them down. And then we will open the floor for everybody and we can discuss uh, as much we wish. Uh, so now uh, the technical uh, uh, remark is that uh, uh, most of panelists speak, uh, speak um, uh, English. Only the Father Scaleda presentation will be translated uh, from Russian. So, um, but to facilitate the discussion, uh, if you don't mind, Father Kaleda, we will ask you questions in English, uh, and but of course you will uh, answer in in in, uh, in in Russian. And then during the discussion, you may ask uh, whether in Russian or in English, because uh, everything is uh, uh, translated. So uh, thank you very much. At, at the moment, I would like to invite uh, Pastor Thomas Junter to make the, 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 the floor is yours. And please make your presentation. Thanks for invitation and good afternoon. I tried to get this introduction in our uh, local place in the middle of Berlin in within 10 minutes. Maybe you know some more famous uh, places in Berlin like the Brandenburg 
gate where the wall has been, of course, or the, the famous checkpoint Charlie, but uh, there is uh, a one and a half kilometers long street, simpler street, the Bernauer Straße in German, which is our street where our parish has been situated since 1894, where this street is was a simple street where the ordinary people live. And this, this street contains this church, this church of reconciliation. It is very important that this name was dedicated already in 1894 to keep down all the social tensions in that, uh, in that part of Berlin. It, it is a very proletarian uh, poor part of the town. You see Bernauer Straße. And you see this picture is from the very first um, year of the wall in 61. And uh, it is not the modern type of the wall. This is the very uh, rough and quickly uh, built style of the, the, the wall in his first stage. Oh, sorry. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. This is uh, a picture. Maybe it is, uh, became as an icon uh, for the problem. Uh, this is uh, the soldier Konrad Schumann, uh, exact in the very first days of uh, erecting the wall. You see, not the wall, even the, the wire uh, on the earth, and he uh, he got rid of his weapon and uh, was one of the first refugees. Uh, very, very late after, tens of years later, he suicided himself. This is a very uh, tragic fate of him. And this is the a second from these first days of the wall in 61. It is a construction worker. Uh, his name is Peter Fechter, and even this uh, is an icon. Uh, it became an icon because uh, the wall is from the first time on connected with victims. It is not only uh, an architectural uh, thing. It is connected with such pictures and fates. Because I have to say, I was grown up as an East German uh, guy. We have, haven't heard. Uh, all the names. Uh, even in Berlin, we, uh, we count until today about 140 victims killed only at the Berlin uh, Wall. This is an uh, amount of 150 kilometers around of West Berlin. But after uh, the archives were open, we had this point this afternoon, yeah, we, we get uh, confrontated or get familiar with all these uh, several fates. This is uh, the next stage of the wall when she was renewed and you can see uh, the picture of our church. Uh, the Church of Reconciliation gets a special uh, sound when you see this uh, together. The, the, the wall in his very calm and yeah, nearly uh, like a aesthetic beautiness. But there is uh, the church tower. It, is, it has been unattendable for 24 years. For not, uh, we, this picture is taken from the western uh, side. This is the French sector. And the church is situated on the Russian sector, on the Soviet sector. And uh, this unattendable church I think it became, my, my ears are filled up with the, uh, with the word from this afternoon, um, as a martyrdom, maybe. This is an <laughs> architecture like a martyrdom. It is a significant symbol for this, what you mean. And then uh, you see the 
after 24 years, it, it, this is a, a picture from 85, 1985. Uh, the roof and the windows of all, all the consistence of the building uh, is <coughs> getting bad and uh, it's getting uh, to a ruin and nobody could help. They want to get out some of the interior, uh, something from the altar or uh, something, all the books and uh, things from the Lord's Supper. But the authorities in East Berlin said, you can get all, that, all these things out to East Berlin, but after this, we want to demolish the church because uh, they, want to be, they want to get a free uh, space for shooting. And they feared that somebody could hide, uh, that refugees could hide behind the church, or uh, this, that was the problem. And seven years they ne negotiated uh, to get along with the fate of the church. Seven years. And in the end of these chef seven years of negotiation, in 84, our congregation, my congregation, I've been there since five years now, but my predecessor and all his colleagues in the, in the church board, they decided to follow the, the pressure of the East Berlin authorities, and they, they simply sell the ground, not the building. The building, you see, it is, uh, it's getting a ruin, but they sold the ground, and it was a deal. Uh, they, could, uh, they could buy a ground in East Berlin for this ground, and it was an, an exchange. But my West Berlin congregation got money, half a million East German marks for this uh, deal, and it was the year of 85 in January when this church was demolished. You, you can see this one, and even it became like an icon, as I see in my congregation when I came five years before to this. Everybody shows this, uh, this picture. I stayed at that time in 85. I was a theology student in East Berlin. Only 500 meters away, we were, we were standing on the roof and, of course, observed with a with a feeling of grief, of course, but we, nobody could do something against this uh, development. This is the cross of the church tower. The cross uh, fell into the very close situated cemetery, fell in a grave and was bended, as you can see, and we uh, put this cross uh, on the earth in the near of our nowadays church ground. And this is a picture from 1990. This is, it, it was the very uh, crazy moment in our town. We felt really in the science fiction movie in these weeks and days. Uh, and uh, some members of our uh, democratic movement, we, we, we put seed, simple seed of flowers, of, of, of grains, of, uh, yeah, into the earth of the dead strip. It, it was the beginning of, a, of the new time. And this one is a building. At the left hand are the rescued bells of the former uh, church tower. And in the, uh, in the back, you can see a new chapel. And this chapel was built of earth, of clay, of earth, simple earth, and mixed with the rests of the ruin, the, the demolished ruin. You can see that from inside, this is a very yeah, sp special kind of uh, building uh, a church without any uh, pictures, or you can't put a nail into this wall. It is very calm, maybe, yeah, some people are feeling like in, to be into a new wall, but uh, all the people say, yeah, it is a saving wall. It is a good feeling. And in the back of the church, you see 
like a niece, it's like a corner. And this is the corner, <laughs> like a symbol for the past. The past is not dominated. Uh, the actual, what we are doing there now, but it, there is a corner, there is a niece, and uh, it is part of our uh, narrative of this, what we do there. This is a, um, only a single, picture from this old altar. You can see the altar uh, figures were destroyed by the soldiers. 24 years soldiers in the church on the tower were a machine gun with, with soldiers and in the church they did uh, shooting uh, competitions and such things. We don't restore this uh, only to show. And this is the point of commemorating. We uh, commemorate uh, these uh, 140 biographies during the year, every day, every day at, at uh, 12 o'clock, and we unlight one candle for one biography, every day one biography of these killed people. And you know, these 140 victims of the Berlin Wall are only one part of the, uh, about the number of 2,000 victims at all the, uh, the, the borders around East Germany. And we have the figure of about 5,000 lucky escapes. I mean, not the escape from tens of thousands who fled in the summer of 89 uh, via Hungary. That's not the point. But 5,000 lucky uh, escapes in tunnels, in aircrafts. You know all the stories. This is the uh, window of remembrance uh, because <coughs> Nearly the whole street, the whole Benauer street, and the street was uh, smashed down and expelled of any buildings and all ex the, the people, the inhabitants of the street, of the east side of ben Benauer street, were deported, even in 61. So we, are, we get rid of buildings and people, but we brought back the, the pictures and the names. But the problem is, as I could see five years ago when I came to this point, there are only the victims uh, who are not members of the East German uh, army. We have even eight members of the East German army, and the, uh, the victim associations don't want to remember the victims at the same place, at the same scene, with uh, even victims, but maybe they so, uh, I, it seemed to me, they divide between good victims and bad victims, but they are, they, all they were killed, all they were young, young people. This is, for me, it was very strange. And uh, of course, in our chapel, in our daily uh, services, we commemorate everybody of these people. This is a picture even from inside of our chapel. Uh, this is a picture from one week ago, so that you can see we share with the young uh, generation often this story of uh, the place and of the problems of uh, refuge. We are, belong to the network of the Cross of the Nails. It, is, uh, it was founded, maybe you know it, from the Cathedral of Coventry. And you can see in this picture the, the structure of our wall. This is the church wall, uh, contents the rests of the old church, from ceramic, from wood, from stone. This is um, to feel what uh, kind of emotionality uh, it is the message of this building. Every, nearly everybody who comes to us is at first touching the wall. And this is very special. Maybe it is enough. This is the view from more above. And you can see, this is my point now, uh, the, the area around the chapel is uh, not built with some buildings but we grow their rye. This is a, a kind of a symbol of, of, of hope for us. You can see 
here's the rye, and you can uh, you can grow rye every year at the same time. This is the it was the decision, and it is even an emotional point, not only in a point of agriculture. It is it's became a uh, religious or mystific uh, icon for a new, not only for a new time, even maybe for a new behavior. This is a uh, view through our uh, circle around the chapel to a sculpture given to us from Coventry. And this sculpture is called even Reconciliation, as you can see. And this is uh, a most affected uh, place for our visitors. We have about between one and 2,000 visitors a day in the chapel. And at the all whole memorial, we are with the chapel as congregation. We lived on this memorial. This is very special uh, for us, as you can see. At the right side, this is my congregation in the former West Berlin. It is a uh, very modern style of uh, houses built in the 70s and 60s. And uh, the population there in the former West Berlin, in my congregation now today, is from 70% from migrant people, from Arabic, from East European, from African uh, families living together. And we are do uh, storytelling, as you can see, my colleague in the middle, uh, we uh, tell the story of the field, of the site very often. And of course, this is from the harvest of our field, bread. We have often bread for our things. And the last point, and I am come to the end, uh, not only the chapel and the field and the past, we discover this, this last area of the former dead strip. And this is a garden. It, 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 it became a garden. We called it uh, No Man's Land. And this garden is a place where we bridge, want to bridge the gaps of today, because the milieu of the uh, inhabitants of uh, the part of the town there with these very poor uh, people, uh, in comparison with the very rich people and young people in the former East Berlin, which is so expensive that uh, nearly no East Germans could live there because the rents are so high. But to gap these um, this people, or who wants to have a, a part of Earth, you can see we have some uh, yeah, activities and working, uh, we call it, I call it Subotnik, and you know, uh, it, it works very good, and we tell our stories and we do something together. And it is flourishing, and it is a sign for us uh, for a um, new time, and not only, in my mind, not only commemorating, even to, yeah, to tell the story uh, further to a next point. And we celebrate services sometimes in this new garden. And this is the last picture. Even the, the soil, the soil from the former dead strip, and uh, this is a, a sentence from the Bible. The kingdom of God is like a hidden treasure in the field. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And now I would like to invite Father Kiryu Kaleda to, to the, the floor is yours, please. Я поделюсь опытом. Сохранение памяти и мемориализация одного из наиболее трагических мест в России, места, где 
в 30-х годах во время большого террора производились массовые расстрелы и захоронения. Это Бутский полигон. Бутский полигон – крупнейшее в Центральной России место массовых расстрелов и захоронений жертв коммунистического террора середины 20-го столетия. Расположен он у южной окраины Москвы. По официальным данным, расстрелы на полигоне происходили с конца 1935 года, и по свидетельским показаниям, вплоть до конца 40-х годов, начала 50-х, здесь производились захоронения умерших и расстрелянных в московских тюрьмах. Общее количество захороненных неизвестно, но только в период с августа 1937 -го года по октябрь 1938 -го года по имеющимся документам здесь было расстреляно и захоронено 20 762 человека. В отдельные дни расстреливали по 200-300 человек. 28 февраля 1938 года было расстреляно 562 человека. Основную часть расстрелянных составляют жители Москвы и Московской области – но вместе с ними пострадали жители других областей и бывших республик Советского Союза, а также граждане и выходцы иностранных государств, в том числе 1596 уроженцев Польши. Из них поляками назвались 1176. Около тысячи убиенных были осуждены на смерть за принадлежность к Русской Православной Церкви. Это семь архиереев, 500 священнослужителей, монахи, монахини, церковные старосты и активные примиряне. К настоящему времени из общего числа пострадавших за веру в Бутове 332 прославлены в лике святых, что придает особое значение этому месту, названному патриархом Алексеем Русской Голгофой. В середине 50-х годов полигон был закрыт, и внешнее ограждение было снято. Центральная часть полигона, где находилась основная часть захоронений, была огорожена глухим забором с колючей проволокой и вплоть до середины 50-х годов, 90-х годов находилась под строгой охраной органов. В 93 году, после обнаружения в архиве КГБ документов о проведении восполнения расстрелов в отношении более чем 20 тысяч человек и проведения Министерством госбезопасности специального расследования, Бутовский полигон был признан местом массовых расстрелов и захоронений жертв политических репрессий. Вслед за этим была начата обработка архивно-следственных дел с целью составления кратких биографических справок о пострадавших. В ходе этой работы и было выявлено, что Бутово, в Бутове пострадало большое число священнослужителей Русской Православной Церкви. И святейший патриарх Алексей благословил строительство храма на этом месте. В 1994 году на полигоне был установлен и освящен первый поклонный крест, а в конце 1995 года территория захоронения была передана Русской Православной Церкви, и здесь был построен небольшой деревянный храм. Летом 1997 -го года общиной храма с привлечением необходимых специалистов был произведен раскоп одного из погребальных рвов, проведенный Исследования однозначно подтвердили, что Бутово является местом массового захоронения репрессированных. С 2000 года в пасхальный период на полигоне под открытым небом совершаются патриаршие богослужения, на которые приглашаются духовенство и прихожане московских и подмосковных храмов. В богослужении принимают участие более 300 священнослужителей и около 3-4 тысяч молящихся. В середине 2000-х годов на средства правительств города Москвы и Московской области были проведены исследования территории захоронений, в результате которых было обнаружено 13 погребальных рвов глубиной до 4 метров, шириной до 5 метров, длиной до 100 и более метров. Они копались с эскаваторами. Общая протяженность обнаруженных рвов около 900 метров. Эти рвы были оформлены в виде могильных холмов. В 2004-2007 годах в центре бывшей спецзоны к югу от территории захоронений был возведен каменный двухэтажный храм в честь новомучеников и исповедников российских. В 2007 году рядом с каменным храмом был установлен большой поклонный крест, изготовленный в Соловецком монастыре, 
где в 20-30-х -х годах был расположен один из самых страшных контрационных лагерей. Крест был доставлен Соловков Бутова водным крестным ходом, который прошел по водным системам Беломор-Балтийского канала, Волга-Балта и канала имени Москвы, построенных в 30-х годах 20-го столетия трудом заключенных, а часто и ценой их жизни. В основании креста были положены камни одного из разрушенного московского храма, так что этот крест не только зримо связал Бутовский полигон и Соловки, но стал памятником пострадавших, э, все, всем пострадавших в те годы, а также памятником поруганных храмов. Осознавая, что для многих наших современников важны не только церковные формы э, сохранения памяти о пострадавших, община Бутовского храма развивает и светские формы повиновения. Так, в течение многих лет родственники погибших на полигоне мечтали увековечить память пострадавших путем установления на территории захоронения мемориальных досок с именами всех убиенных на этом месте. Возвращение имен, если хотите. В 2017 году, в годовщину столетия революции, в Бутове был создан такой мемориал. Он имеет образ раскрытого расстрельного рва спускаясь в который посетили, посетители оказываются на одном уровне с расстрелянными, тела которых находятся в погребальных рвах рядом. На стенах памятника, на гранитных досках высечены имена всех 20 762 человек, убиенных на полигоне в 1937-1938 годах, вне зависимости от их национальности, вероисповедований и политических мировоззрений. Вне зависимости, реабилитированы они или нет. Скажу более того, что на этих досках указаны и имена тех, кто до этого был сотрудником ЧК и принимал, сам принимал активное участие в репрессиях. Списки пострадавших сгруппированы по датам расстрелов, а внутри списка в алфавитном порядке по фамилиям. Для каждого убиенного указана его фамилия, имя и дата рождения. Общая длина памятника составляет 300 метров при высоте 2 метра. На сегодняшний день мемориал сад памяти является крупнейшим в России памятником, установленным на месте захоронения пострадавших в годы массовых репрессий советского времени. Отметим, что сооружение, сооружен этот мемориал на средства, пожертвованные внуком одного из убиенных на Будском полигоне. В настоящее время Община храма трудится над созданием музея памяти пострадавших в Бутове. Он располагается в бывшем усаденном флигеле, где в 30-х годах находилась комендатура полигона. Развивая светские формы повиновения убиенных на полигоне, община Бутовского храма в течение ряда лет 30 октября, когда в России отмечается Государственный день памяти заключенных, проводит акцию «Голос памяти» во время которой прочитываются имена всех убиенных на этом месте. Чтение имен продолжается более 8 часов. В нем принимают участие родственники репрессированных, прихожане храма, учащиеся различных учебных заведений, представители дипломатического корпуса. В том числе регулярно бывает посол Евросоюза в России, а также послы и сотрудники посольств Польши и стран Прибалтики. Таким образом, в результате совместной деятельности церкви и светского общества в Бутове создан уникальный церковно-общественный мемориальный комплекс памяти пострадавших в годы советской власти, который сохраняет память о людях, невинно пострадавших в годы бесчеловечного эксперимента по построению рая на земле без Бога. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much for your for your presentation. And now I would like to introduce priest Professor Piotr Mazurkiewicz. Please, the floor is yours. Um, as I was asked to, to talk also on a with some examples and concrete things. 
So let's start concerning memory, the fact that today we commemorate uh, the 40th anniversary of the election of Cardinal Wojtyla as the Pope. Uh, that's also is making uh, our history, and this is, was one of the most uh, influential people in the uh, contemporary history of, of Europe. Uh, he wrote uh, also a book uh, uh, with the title Memory and Identity. So that these two things are important and that uh, memory for us is so important because due to the memory, we are getting our identity. We know from where do we come and because of this, we know who we are. Uh, in Prague, in, in Czech Republic, which uh, uh, is called also a city of 100 towers. Uh, the Pope said that uh, if you will uh, not understand the meaning of those towers, you will be strangers in your own homeland, in your own country. And uh, memory is something very precious uh, in the Catholic Church on the one hand, uh, even during the Eucharist, the uh, priest has to say the words of, uh, to repeat the words of Jesus, do this in my commemoration. So the commemoration of the Last Supper and of the cross and resurrection is making the church. Uh, and uh, this uh, commemoration is transmitted from one generation to the other. I think that the Jew, Jewish community, this, for, the, for the Jews, this is very precious. Uh, there's a wonderful picture uh, given by a French poet, Charles Pequy, who is saying, when we are entering a church, there's a vessel with blessed water. So the father is putting the finger to this blessed water, and then is giving a drop, is transmitting a drop of the water from the finger of the father to the finger of the son, and from the finger of the mother to the finger of the daughter. So this way, the, the tradition, because tradition is transmission from one generation to the other, uh, is making the, the identity of, of a person, of the community. And in Polish history, making also uh, uh, the, 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 giving also the sense of uh, national community, because due to the partition and the lack of national, of the, of the uh, state uh, in the political meaning, so uh, there was a direct link between the Catholic Church, Catholics usually form only 75% of the Polish uh, society, uh, and the only institution representing the nation, which was the Catholic Church, and which, uh, which always tried to be independent. So this is why we have this strong link between Catholicism and, and uh, Polish identity in our history. But this was, uh, uh, we can say there were two institutions very important. One is the church, the second is the family. So that this transmission of culture, of memory, is going through the family. And uh, uh, what is transmitted? That's uh, the faith, the national culture, uh, but also the general understanding of human being. So that we have in, uh, in our history all those good things to commemorate, but also sins, evil, and, and so on. And we have to remember both. Uh, and uh, this way, we can also uh, er evaluate our past. Uh, because memory and history, this is not the same. Memory is the way how we perceive the history and it's also a matter of uh, our choice. So we can, we are able to change the meaning of history. Uh, so this is what we are doing, uh, for example, in the process of purification of memory and, and, and so on. Uh, then uh, if we refer to some concrete elements uh, uh, in, in this history, I think it's, it's important to refer to the exchange of the letters between the Polish bishops and the German. Uh, this 
uh, on reconciliation after the Second War. This was 1965. Uh, the first impulse was the fact that during the Vatican Council, there were Polish and, bishop, uh, and German bishops attending the Council, and they were not able to shake hands each other, even if they were bishops at the same room. Uh, so that's the, this was the reason why uh, Archbishop Kominek from Wroclaw started to, to think on this and to write a letter, uh, which was approved by the, the whole, whole Polish Bishops' Conference uh, with this uh, famous phrase, we forgive and we ask for forgiveness. Uh, it was uh, obvious for everyone in Poland that we uh, can forgive uh, because we were victims. But uh, the bishops had to justify why they asked for forgiveness, saying that even if there was one poor who commit evil against Germans, that's enough to ask for forgiveness. So that you don't uh, have to calculate exactly, but, but uh, you see that uh, if there is war, uh, they are no totally innocent. Uh, mm, this uh, mm, uh, provoked also a, a very harsh attack from the part of uh, communist government, because this was regarded as an act of uh, create, act creating international policy. So the communists said, this is our task the church shouldn't intervene in Polish-German relationship. Uh, so the bishops should to justify that at that time in front of the faithful, in front of the government, and then there, for two years there was no answer from Germany. So the Germans were not prepared for this letter. Finally, we received uh, uh, an answer from the Protestant church in Germany uh, but this was just a document which was a memorial which was prepared for internal use in the German Protestant Church. And they say, say this is our reflection, so we will send this to the Catholic bishops in Poland. Uh, then only the process started also with uh, political results because there was a the relationship, diplomatic relationship was established between Poland and Germany. There was a visit of Willy Brandt in Warsaw and, and, and so on. Uh, but this is uh, one example. When we are coming to the, the present time, uh, after the collapse of communists, the bishops also sent a letter to the Ukrainian bishops uh, from the uh, Greek Catholic Church. And there was an exchange, uh, also not very easy at the beginning. And they also st uh, started uh, an exchange of letters with the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, which uh, was much more difficult also because of the difference in, in confession and, 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 and so on. But uh, I think that, that uh, these gestures uh, they are also changing the, uh, the perception of, of the history of the relationship by the ordinary people, it's, let's say, so that, that uh, even if uh, at the political level or interinstitutional level, uh, it's not everything as should be, uh, so the relationship between people are quite good. There is also this dimension concerning reconciliation uh, after communists in the country, which was mentioned by our German friend so that uh, uh, also crimes were committed in Poland and we till today we are uh, uh, rediscovering graves mostly my perception from 1952 and uh, uh, on the other hand only f f uh, from very few years we have ac real access to the archives so that uh, the doc documentation, what happened, and what, who, what uh, happened also to the people, and who was a hero, we are discovering from this dark past also, 
examples of real heroes of faith, of uh, faithfulness, and, and, and so on. So that, that uh, as, uh, for example, we have this uh, Saint Maximilian Kolbe from Auschwitz, we have also saints or great, in a secular sense also, heroes from this dark communist time. The last thing I would like to mention is that uh, for this reason, on the one hand, it's very important to be able to forgive, but not to forget. So we have to keep in our memory also those crimes, big, uh, as Holocaust, for example, and, and other crimes, because this is a, a, a part of our human heritage, and only if we will remember and well understand what should be avoided in the future, and what are the mechanisms, how the crimes are going. Only in this moment, we will be more clever than the past generation. So it's very important to forgive, that is forgiveness, but and this, on the other hand, never to forget in, uh, in this sense that uh, mm, mm, this is very important for the whole humanity. That's the, also a question, who should take care for this memory? Uh, in my understanding, always it's much better if these are the community of the uh, perpetrators. Because the community from the vic of the victims will always have this in mind. But uh, uh, this uh, can be regarded also as a kind of repeating accusation. You did this. But if this memory is important for the whole humanity, for the heritage of humanity, it's, it means that the perpetrators can say, yes, we know this is a, our past, and we, we remember this for the future of the whole humanity. And the last thing is that uh, John Paul II when he was traveling uh, after the communists all over Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, he was saying that reconciliation is the most important thing after the communism. But at the same time, that reconciliation is uh, not a secular value. So that when we are asking why people should reconcile, this is invented by Christianity. You have the main reason for this in the gospel. And even if people are not Christian, but they, they regard this as something very natural and obvious, that's due to the fact that they are formed in the, uh, in the Christian culture. And uh, in this sense, it's, it's very important always to discover this deep dimension of the process of, uh, of reconciliation, uh, uh, which is referring also to the fact that in this Christian understanding, we should at first be reconciled with God, so that this vertical dimension is the first and the most important in Christian, in, in Catholic Church, we are calling this sacrament of reconciliation. And due to the fact that I am reconciled with God, I am open for the other, also to ask for forgiveness and to forgive. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I would like to invite uh, uh, Sufi Andrzej Saramovic. Please, the floor is yours. Good evening, and first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this conference and, of course, inviting me. Thank you. Um, well, um, it's, uh, I didn't know how to grasp the subject because it's, it's a very lengthy, it's, it's fairly new to me, actually. But um, I think I reconciled it somehow. So <clears throat> by the means of introduction, uh, I think that we have to um, uh, get some background to the 
uh, Islamic philosophy, which is perhaps not very well known. Uh, so to understand uh, Islam and Muslims, we really have to go back to the roots, uh, the basics, to the background. So the background will be the memory, of course. Um, so I shall begin with rather a lofty uh, scenario, the beginning before the time was born. Uh, it is called the primordial covenant between man and God, the sentence of Adam, the, the humanity. It is called Abba Allah to be Rabbikum. The Arabic word in sun corresponds to human being. This word takes its roots from the word Nisyan, which literally means forgetfulness. Man is undeniably a very forgetful creature, but fortunately for him, God created everything in pairs, like created Adam and Eve. Uh, when the faculty of forgetfulness of mankind possesses uh, also faculty of remembrance. So it's not that he, human being always forgets, because he's got also memory to counterbalance. Uh, within the Muslim, especially a uh, mystical Islam discourse, a process of affecting the remembrance of secrets against the background of humanity's inherent condition of forget forgetfulness is strongly emphasized. That which is to be remembered is articulated in terms of this primordial covenant uh, between God and souls of women and men. The verse of the, of the Quran uh, provides the evidence of this covenant, uh, and I quote the Quran. I won't tell you the, 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 the ayat and, and the surah because it's probably, uh, I, I can provide that information to the interested. <clears throat> Otherwise, it would take too long if I say uh, verse. Uh, 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 chapter 7, verse 172, which in fact it is. Okay, so I, I quote Quran. <laughs> Recall that your Lord summoned all the descendants of Adam and had them bear witness for themselves. Am I not your Lord? <laughs> Alas to be Rabbikum. They all said, yes, we bear witness. Thus, you cannot say on a day of res resurrection, we were not aware of that, or we didn't remember. Of course, human being, as I just said, is very forgetful. And the moment human being is born, actually remembers who is the big boss, who is running the show. So uh, this is the, the beginning of, of the trouble that human being has, who really forgets who is, who is their lord. Um, of course, how forgetful human being is, I don't need to convince anyone. Uh, we bear witness to uh, the most cruel, the cruelest war in uh, modern history, and in the space of 20 years. So where is the human memory? How do they use the, the memory? Um, Muslims uh, strive to return to the experience of that day, day of the alas, as they call it, through what is called a dhikr. A dhikr means remembrance that they practice in different ways. Um, and Mary Schimmel, who was a German uh, orientalist, uh, the, the best experts on uh, Islam and, and Sufis, especially. Uh, Anmer Shimil explains that the goal of the dhikr is to reach the stage in which the subject is lost in the object, in which recollection, recollecting subject and recollecting object becomes again one, as they were before the day of Allah. I hope it was not too complicated. Uh, <clears throat> this is from my Islamic perspective its very first collective memory of the whole humanity with the powerful repercussions of humans past, present, and future. Humanity who are born with the instinctive knowledge of memory about God, as knowing is nothing but memory. This belief is at the heart of Islam. It is related to central doctrine of oneness of being, which is called in Arabic Tawhid, the foundation of Islamic monothe monotheism. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, another concept which is very relevant to our consideration, which is called fitrah, which is another Arabic word which can be translated something like, roughly like, primordial human nature or an instinct. Uh, according to Islamic uh, theology, human beings are born with the innate inclination toward of, of tawhid, of oneness, from maybe collective memory, which is encapsulated in the fitra, along with compassion, intelligence, ihsan, and all other attributes that embody what it is to be truly human. In so far, this reason 
that some Muslims prefer to refer to those who embrace Islam as rivers rather than converts, it is believed that they are returning to the perceived pure state. Some, some people who converted to Islam, they say, you, know, you don't convert, you revert, you become the one who you were always. Uh, so, um, Islam, I'm using in term of Islam, not as historical Islam, as a, as, a, as a means of submission to the will of God, which is quite common in all three Abrahamic, Abrahamic religions. Uh, <clears throat> um, this concept of fitra is, is not dissimilar to uh, what uh, Immanuel Kant, et, uh, his ethical concept called ought, or perhaps Calvinist term, uh, sensus divinitatis. So sensation of, of, the, of uh, like a primordial feeling of, of God, the existence of God. Of course, the trait of forgetfulness and, and memory has two sides as everything. So there is a positive side, a negative one. The positive role of memory would be to learn and to remember in order to learn from experience, to draw conclusions, to take lessons. Without memory, we wouldn't be able to learn. So the memory is like a double-edged sword we remember equally good, be, good things and bad things and cannot easily erase the memory. Forgiveness may, in very uh, quote unquote, change the past and may have a healing effect. And it is an example when remembering turn, can turn a harmful and destructive experience to healing the past. Um, uh, Quran uh, actually provides uh, uh, many examples of, uh, of some disasters like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, uh, like Quran says, people of Lord deny the warning. In, in other words, they didn't remember. So, uh, yeah, Quran supplies that kind of examples of, of the past that humanity behave in a thoughtless way. Um, uh, earlier mentioned the word uh, dhikr means the remembrance of God. Remembrance of God is the most sacred act in any religion because more than any, because more than any uh, other ritual act, it embodies the presence of God. The most important ritual in Islam is the cano canonical prayers called Salat. Um, I just one quote from the Quran, remember me and I shall remember you. Be grateful unto me and deny me not. Okay, so from the lofty things of, of heaven we go down, to uh, Karbala, the year is uh, 680. Uh, two armies stand against each other. One army is about uh, a few hundred people, another one was a few thousand. And of course, there is the beginning of big martyrdom of Karbala. The comments below are based on Pierre Nora's concept of, and pardon my French, lieu de mémoire, which is the memory of place, which refers to places, objects, or events that have a significant meaning to a particular group's collective memory. Twelve a Shia, Shia is the one of the vision of Islam, in case you, did, you, did, you, you didn't know. Twelve a Shia remember annually the death of Imam Hussein, who was killed together with his supporters at the Battle of Karbala by the Umayyad Caliph's troops in southern Iraq, 680. Through the performance of various commemorative rituals, practices, theatrical performances of various um, and, and the numerous literary artistic productions, this event is memorized every year. In, uh, in fact, uh, can have quite um, a bloody uh, uh, manifestation because uh, not infrequently people who, uh, who exaggerate the, the, the religion, they, they actually flagellate themselves quite painfully and uh, there's a lot of blood. Around, but this is a kind of then day of mourning for, for, for Shia. Um, so um, the Nora's concept of place of memory has, has a significant meaning to a, a particular group's collective memory. And through these commemorative practices, Shia are able to present the Karbala narrative as a place of memory, allowing the cons construction of a coherent Shia uh, identity around the uh, uh, persecution, displacement, and maltreatment of Shia around the centuries. Um, in Islamic ritual, pilgrimage has also commemorative uh, events uh, um, around the time of Abraham, who uh, in uh, Islamic narrative, he built 
the, 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 the Kaaba, the Temple of Kaaba. Um, um, and of course, circumambulation going around the Kaaba is also, um, as Muslim belief, from, uh, from the time of Abraham. So biblical figures, the, the prophets, and Jesus from the Gospel mentioned in Quran, they all part of a collective memory in the religion of Islam, which is regarded by Muslims as a continuum of the same, or not the same, but continuum of revealed religion. Uh, okay, it, I would just, I have a lot more to share with you, but there is not much time, so I'll just give one example of, for, for instance, vendetta, which is not confined to Islam only, but it is, it actually functions in Islam. Um, it may serve as a good example of collective memory, negative social aspects of, the, of, the, of, the, of memory. When people have not enough goodwill to break the vicious circle, they actually, uh, there's never ending. Uh, there, there's no one breaks up the, the, the chain of cause and effects. Uh, so Islam allows this kind of compensation, or if you will, revenge, but at the same time enjoins forgiveness as an act far superior than revenge. Okay, I shall uh, finish at this point and expect you to ask some questions in case uh, I didn't say everything. So thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to, uh, to, 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 to invite Rabbi Joshua Elias, please. Shalom, uh, the Revitor. Good afternoon. Um, first, I, I have to apologize. I, I was late. I'm the reason we're late now. I'm very sorry. Thank you for your forgiveness. Um, <laughs> memory. Uh, I'm going to be speaking in a uniquely Jewish-Polish perspective here. Um, there are, about 80 years ago, there were about 3.5 million Jews in Poland. Today, no one's really sure. Somewhere between 500 and 50,000 Jews live in Poland. Um, there are approximately 1,400 Jewish cemeteries in Poland. Uh, the amount of cities that Jews used to live in and what remains there varies greatly. What should be memorialized? What should be remembered and why? And of course, who is remembering this? I'm not a historian, but I love history. I'm a rabbi. My goal, my obligation is from a religious perspective. So there are certain objects that were very important to the Jewish community when they existed, when the Jewish community existed, that parts of them might even remain. The most obvious would be something like a synagogue, a house of prayer. As a rabbi, a former synagogue is of almost no importance to me whatsoever. It's a place that was used for Jews to gather and to pray, but today holds no holiness, has no, almost no significance in terms of Jewish law. The holiest item that we have in general is a Sefer Torah, the, the a Torah, the, 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 the written, handwritten version of the five books of Moses. According to our tradition, it was first, um, it was first, trans, it was first um, given over, what was written there was first given over about 3,300 years ago on Mount Sinai. It was finally written 40 years later in the fields of Moab by Moshe, our, our, our rabbi, our, our educator. To this day, from that original copy, we make the copies that we have today, most every synagogue has one, two, three, sometimes more. It is the most holy object that we have, but holier than that still is a human body. Even when no soul inhabits it. That being said, according to our value system, the most important remaining object in any community is a cemetery. I'm not speaking about cemeteries today. Um, when the Nazis invaded Poland, uh, they started before, but when Nazis invaded Poland, they started killing a lot of people, including many Jews. When the, as uh, in 19, June 1941, with the beginning of Operation Barbarossa, uh, it was a, it represented a new stage in, uh, in the Nazis' extermination of uh, the Jews of Europe and Poland. Um, and the result being that uh, in large parts of Poland that, are, uh, that were the, for, the, the former Soviet areas, not only, but, but, but 
mostly um, in those areas. There are, in any city that had Jewish inhabitants before the war, you have at least one, if not numerous, mass graves. Not to mention incidental places where Jews were murdered and left, and oftentimes buried. As a rabbi, this is something very important to me. The, these, these mass graves are full of the holiest things that we know of. And we're obligated to care for them, to preserve them, and not in any way possible to disturb them. The, there is um, one of the most basic laws uh, when it comes to treatment of the dead in cemeteries is the prohibition against moving a body that has been buried. There are certain rare exceptions. There are certain times when it, they can be moved. They're very rare. They happen very, they, they, it occurs very rarely. But the general pretty ironclad rule is you don't move a body from where it lies. So this creates a conflict, or at least a challenge, and that is, how do we know where mass graves lie? Or where individuals lie? We are the same law that tells us that we have to protect these places and honor the dead there, also tells us that we can't dig there. Um, so modern technology is helping us tremendously. Uh, we rely on, so first and foremost, there's nothing better than a witness, right? And this is one place actually where we're, we're very challenged now because most of the witnesses who are left, who might have seen this or might have heard from their parents or grandparents about something that happened, or someone was buried in this place, they're disappearing. What other tools do we have? There are many records that were gathered by uh, many different organizations. Now they're in the hands of IPN, Institut Pamiente Narodove, the, the national, um, the national institution of the Institute of National Memory, um, where we have the, um, testimonies of, de of varying degrees of quality. Um, and we also have tools, uh, new tools that are being created, such as LIDAR. LIDAR is a light uh, indicating radar. It's a, it's a, an airplane flies over an area and flashes uh, a laser. And, and using the, and as the laser comes back, the, uh, the information is gathered. And you're able to take a look at a terrain, what it looks like without any organic matter on top. You see just the lay of the land which can often be helpful indicating where places where things are buried up or dug or buried up. We also have ground penetrating radar. Uh, it's a radar used, that you use in the ground that helps indicate where things have been disturbed underground. Um, using archival research, uh, working with, uh, with witnesses, uh, LIDAR and um, um, ground penetrating radar, we are often able to find, locate, and even find out the names of people who were buried in these various places. The number of mass graves that currently exist is completely unknown. Some city, some villages, you have two or three in the cemetery, plus one or two random people killed in one or two random places. Um, our obligation is to first and foremost protect them, but also to commemorate them. Um, there, beyond that, the vast majority of these places are places where Jews have not lived for 80 years and will not live. The way to, it's not if we go to these places and we, uh, we protect, we, 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 we physically protect the sites, that does not ensure them a future. The only thing that can ensure a future for these sites is the interest of the local community, their ownership of the site. So we've started a process, we've been doing it for about 10 years now, we're trying to accelerate it, where which we combine research with contact with the community uh, and commemoration uh, in order to, um, to commemorate, the memorialize, commemorate these people but also to help 
the local inhabitants not only feel connected to the place, but also feel released from it. In general, these are sites that everyone knows about. No one will talk about it, but everyone knows about it. And usually secrets like that, they do a lot of damage to the psyche of individuals and of the city. By allowing the locals to feel connected, to take ownership, it also allows for this, this wound to be transformed into a source of healing. Um, all the more so when we, you, when we, when we finally uh, dedicate these places, we try and bring Jews from Israel or, or local community members so there can be a pro an actual process of uh, communication and, uh, and reconciliation. Um, there is a very great challenge now, which is um, dealing with the government. Uh, Polish, Poland is a highly decentralized country. Uh, most of these places, if we, want, if we want to be able to place a memorial there, we need to get approval from, of course, from the, the various local governments and up to the level of voyevoda, something like a county. So, whereas for us, if we have testimony, archival uh, evidence, and, uh, and um, LIDAR, or ground penetrating radar results that indicate something there, that's, that's 9,500%. Oftentimes, voyevodas, heads of counties, they want archeological research. They want us to dig. It's their choice. <laughs> what can we do? We won't dig. So it means that oftentimes these sites have to remain unmemorialized. So beyond that, the process takes very long. And the number to, to, to deal with it, to, I, I don't know if anyone this year has, had the, the, has been blessed to deal with uh, Polish uh, bureaucracy. But um, it's one of the things, I think, that didn't die with communism. Um, and so the process of even trying to get, the, even to get a meeting with these people, right, can, can take quite a while. So we've developed a new tactic, which is, uh, I call it guerrilla, guerrilla grave placing. <laughs> um, we, with, with help of friends, we've been able to produce Simple wooden matzevot. A matzeva is a memorial. It says simply, "Here lie Jews who were who were murdered. Here lie Jews of blessed memory who were murdered during the Holocaust." It says in Polish. And last summer, we were able to place about 30 of them. God willing, in the fall, we'll, we'll, we'll go on another project. Um, is it legal? I didn't ask a lawyer. It's kosher. Having these, these wooden matze vote in the place changes the way that the people perceive it. It's very interesting that the people actually, they almost unquestionably accept the authority of these markers. Uh, I was at, we were at a site, there's a site called Adampol. It's a sub-camp of Sobibor, located about 10 kilometers from Sobibor. There are about 24 pits with probably about 500 people buried in them completely uncommemorated, unmarked, um, covered in trash usually. So we've been working, but the, this, it's the voyevode of this area is very difficult to work with. Um, so we put one of these matzevot there, and a few months later we went back to check the site, and there were forestry workers there, and they saw us, and they, they saw we were Jewish, and they said, oh, you, the thing you're looking for is over there, right there. And they, they pointed us to the matzeva. To them already, it established this as a place of memorial. Regardless of what the government said, regardless of anything else, even the details they might not know, already it was established. Hopefully in the future that will allow us to establish something more permanent with more details. Um, memory is getting more and more complex today in Poland. If, and as such, 
all the more important to speak about. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It was so interesting and so intensive that uh, we really, uh, you really touched upon so many questions which are so important for memory researchers. It was about guilt, about uh, forgiveness, about uh, persecutors, about uh, for forget. Fullness. And uh, I think that maybe first um, uh, question from us would be uh, exactly about uh, forgetting. So as a man is a, a forgetful creature, uh, what, um, what is in your religion um, um, possible to forget, or um, uh, when is it time to forget, uh, so to say, uh, when it is allowed to uh, stop remembering? And uh, because in the memory studies, we always speak about uh, memory, but also about forgetting, and we have uh, uh, some books uh, written on forgetting, and uh, you almost in all your presentations spoke about forgetting, but uh, it seems that memory is a virtue, uh, something good, and uh, uh, forgetting is something bad. So uh, is it really like this, or wh what do you think about forgetting in uh, this dimension? Uh, yeah, it's uh, to everyone, uh, because I think that you all uh, somehow touched upon these things about forgetting, and uh, but in different uh, contexts, uh, like uh, it's uh, possible to forgive, but not possible to uh, forget, uh, like uh, this. Yes, yes, Pastor. Only to begin and give an example, this is often a competition or a conflict. Uh, which should be and can be forget. We have uh, to, uh, the link to the issue of a cymmetry. Uh, our street, the Benauer Strasse, as I have shown you, it, uh, the first third of the street on the East Berlin side were cemeteries. And in the, in the autumn of 89, of course, our neighbor congregations in East Berlin want to get back their cemetery because the wall was built in 61 covering all the graves and they don't mention what uh, who was buried there uh, they the, the wall and all this the vices of the wall the uh, covered the graves and in 89 of course all our east german uh, parishes want to get back their two cemeteries and the priests uh, and the pastors uh, fight to not forget that this place has been a cemetery. But the colleague of in West Berlin side, in my congregation, even at the, at the opposite side walk, even 10 meters, he and his West Berlin uh, fighters for a memorial of the wall wants to, yeah, wants to raise up a memorial to not to forget the victims, you know, and what the wall has been. And of course, the West Berlin uh, initiators of the mem memorial of the war were, it, it was like an, a finger. You can, we will build the memorial and you should see and you will see how bad the communism has been. And this, it was a, a, a big conflict for years, for years. And in the end, after I think 12, 13 years fighting in front of law and in church and official public laws, courts, they decide to get a compromise. compromise. And uh, they have, they put this window of remembrance, as you have seen in the picture, with the faces and the names, on the former cemetery. And the, and the congregation said, OK, you can, you can now get rid of 
the wall, the pieces of the wall, standing on the, of the former cemetery. And the Western side said, no, we demonstrate the conflict. We let it as it is. There's no picture, no declaration for the visitors, but I tell the story every day because the question is how to remember, how to deal with the uh, different, um, hardly often emotional uh, wishes, what is not to forget. Mm, thank you. Um, a few, um, a few different ideas. One, um, the, in, <clears throat> in Judaism, we have uh, most of our, our religions are from the Bible. We have two post-biblical religions, uh, two post-biblical holidays. I'm sorry, two post-biblical holidays, and the introduction to them, uh, to the, the, hol the Hanage, ho holiday of Hanukkah, uh, in the Gemara, it, it mentions that there used to be a. There's, we still have it. There's a book that. that uh, uh, which is a the scroll of holidays, in which it had listed for almost every day of the year a different miracle that happened or a different tragedy that happened to, to Jewish communities in different places, and, and they were all commemorated. It says that it got to be so much that finally the rabbis canceled it all out, except for two of them. M memory can get too heavy. It can become too cumbersome. I think what's important to discuss is the difference between forgetting and releasing. That there's issue of, of, there's issue of memory and there's issues of trauma. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we forget trauma and don't release it. Uh -huh. Whereas memories we, we, we release but don't forget. Um, the, the process of releasing trauma has the potential of changing memory. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that often the question is about transforming as opposed to forgetting. But certainly, the, according to my, my limited understanding of psychology, we, we say that forgetting is as, as much a function of memory as, as, mem as remembering things are. Mm -hmm. um, Um, just, just a quickly, um, as Islamic uh, perspective on, on the issue of forgetting. Um, uh, Muslims are trained from, uh, uh, taught in the religion to forgive, like, like be in a state of ongoing forgiveness. So if we do something wrong and, uh, and even someone done something wrong to us, we, we for, we're trying to forgive. And there is a formula, even astakfirullah, astakfirullah. I've done some stupid thing to a, to a friend or some thoughtless uh, or some blunder. So I instantly appeal to God for forgiveness. And so we ask for forgiveness, God, in the first place. And then we ask for forgiveness, people who done, we've done something wrong to. Um, any conflicts, any Ill, Ill feelings between two parties, they should be reconciled as soon as possible. So in that sense, uh, Islam is quite pragmatic religion that doesn't dwell much in the past. In the past, in, in mourning uh, after death uh, is allowed because this is human feeling, but uh, Islam is, enjoins uh, the, 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 the rule of the middle way, not too much exaggeration with, with either way, not too much uh, devotion, religious devotion and not and, and lack of devotion. It has to be always in the middle. So that's why Muslims do not erase any monuments. Um, these are actually monuments, if you, you find, for instance, I don't know, Ib Khaldun monument in, in Tunisia, but mind you, this is not Islamic idea. This is rather a Christian concept of building monuments. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the memory of that, according to Islam, um, human life is like an unwritten book. You write it down and you, you write your story, <laughs> the last page you write whatever you want in a hurry, and then the book is closed, and it, there, is a, there is no chance to reverse anything, to do any, to repair any wrong, wrongdoings that we have done. So we have to do it while we're alive. And the chapter is closed, and, and then we don't bother the people who, who are dead. 
with the remembrance, rem remembrance. There is no going to uh, uh, cemeteries or anything like that. We just consider is that uh, a human being takes responsibility for what he or she uh, takes responsibility in, within one's life, and and then it's, it's the, the whole story ends. The, everything is in the hands of God. So evoking uh, dead people is to no avail because that's not going to change the situation. And according to the faith, we get usually what we deserve. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, as human beings, we always forget. And with age, uh, we are more conscious of this fact. So I can meet uh, a man, I know him. Uh, I realize he is my colleague from the secondary school. He was sitting nearby 40 years ago, but what is his name? And then I am trying to, to, to find the right name. John, no, no, I, I know that this is not John. Uh, maybe Henry, no, that doesn't fit to him. So partially I remember, partially I have forgot. Mm -hmm. But uh, even just to, to, to try to, to find the right name, uh, it means that still this is in my memory. But uh, uh, when you, that's uh, the St. Augustine thinking, on, on wonderful on, on the memory and, and the past. But uh, uh, when we are asking what can be forgotten, and, uh, this is so on. Uh, uh, this is from the moral point of view. So, what we are allowed uh, to forget, and what we should, from the moral point of view, uh, remember, maybe we can say forever. And uh, 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 the memory is, is dynamic. So this is a kind of process. And uh, this means also that we are making a choice as an individual person, but also as communities. And uh, uh, if, uh, are we allowed to forget, uh, for example, Homer? Or are we allowed to forget Bach or Mozart? And a lot of music is forgotten without any harm to the ha culture and humanity. Uh, so you are evaluating this. Are we allowed to forget Torah or not? And uh, uh, when we are looking on the human history from this moral point of view, uh, there was a lot of crimes, a lot of wars. Uh, Young people are not conscious of them, even if they happened only 20 years ago. That's a different generation. I, I remember when I came, I, I was working uh, in a, my first parish in Radzimin. This is 20 kilometers from here. On the one, one hand, there was a cemetery from the 1920 war. And the communists always tried to uh, uh, destroy totally the cemetery, the whole communist time. So it was preserved to the parish priests and families. On the other hand, this was uh, the majority of uh, inhabitants before the war were Jews. And uh, Isaac Bashevich Singer was born there. And uh, the Poles, Catholics, they decided to commemorate this because they were proud of the fact that he was born there. Uh, if, uh, then there are some, in a certain sense, unique uh, events. So really, are we allowed to forget the Holocaust? Because this was, uh, in a certain sense, a new kind of crime. Uh, and it was possible, as we know today, uh, because people have forgotten the Armenian genocide. So that 
those perpetrators, they are thinking, uh, people will never discover this. People will not remember. So uh, we can allow to us to commit this or that crime because everything will be forgotten. And she, for this reason, the, they are uh, events in the human history in a positive sense, like Bach, like the gospel, uh, in a negative sense, like the genocide, uh, which should be preserved for, for the humanity. But uh, what should be preserved, that's evaluation. So if uh, we are uh, dramatically changing the selection, we are changing our identity. We are becoming a different community. Yeah, thank you. And Father uh, Kaleda. Но если говорить о такой вот моральной стороне памяти, понятно, что в силу нашей человеческой немощи мы забываем какие-то вещи, и они уходят в небытие, и, может быть, это нужно для нашего мозга, который не может вместить всю информацию. Но возвращаясь именно моральной, то, наверное, мы можем и даже, наверное, должны, должны забывать нанесенные нам обиды. И это является свидетельством того, что мы эту обиду прощаем. Но если говорить об людях, ушедших из этого мира, то ведь в христианской традиции, когда человек провожается в мир иной, ему поется вечная память. Вечная память. И сохранение памяти об этом человеке важно для церкви. И если в силу... Вот с человеческой немощи мы забываем имя этого человека, то в православной традиции имеется такая форма, когда мы поминаем, кого мы помним по именам, а также всех от века усопших христиан. То есть память об человеке – это является несомненно ценностью. И если уже обращать к нашему времени, ну, к 20 веку, проблемам 20 века, когда действительно вот предпринимались попытки забыть вот тот инцидент, который произошел в 20-х годах, когда люди погибли, или то, что происходило, скажем, на Будском полигоне, когда это место было засекречено в течение длительного времени, и память о тех людях, которые, старались, которые пострадали на этом месте, предпринимались попытки стереть, уничтожить память об этих людях, то как раз наша священная обязанность эту память восстановить. И вот действительно это является христианской традицией, хотя имеет, может быть, и светские формы, но именно в глубоко укорено в христианской традиции организация, создание таких мемориалов, которые созданы сейчас в Бутовой или созданы в других местах, в том числе и в Катве. Спасибо. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that now we will uh, give uh, the floor to our audience and we won't take uh, this um, unique opportunity from you to ask uh, the questions. Julianne Funk from Switzerland. I work in Bosnia with Bosnian Muslims and I'm curious about um, well, two things. You mentioned zikr as a way of remembrance, and I was just chatting with my friend there to ask if they ever use zikr in Bosnia for commemorating. And he said, no, not really. Um, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. Is that, is that used as, for example, in the case of Bosnia, post-war commemoration? He says it's not done there, um, rather tevhid. Um, and also, your comment about memorials I thought was interesting because in Bosnia, Muslims definitely do build memorials. Um, so maybe that's particular to Bosnia or maybe, I don't know, it's done elsewhere. Just curious. Я бы по-русски сначала скажу, потом перейду на английский. Я бы хотела спросить вот, по поводу Бутовского полигона. Вы сказали, что там планируется музей памяти создать. Мне было бы очень интересно узнать, что может быть в таком музее, потому что 
мне кажется, полигон это ну, расстрельный, это как кладбище, но там не было никакой человеческой деятельности. Да, на это, ну, короче говоря, <laughs> я не хочу тут долго разглагольствовать, но просто я пытаюсь понять, что может быть в таком музее, вот именно музей на месте полигона. Я понимаю, что там может быть мемориал, а какой, что будет в музее? So my question is about the Museum of Memory at Butova Polygon. Ну, мы давно ощущаем необходимость рассказать именно светским языком и музейным языком об истории полигона. На, от, и в храмах, и в, на территории захоронения сложно рассказать об истории этого места, сложно рассказать об тех приказах, на основании которых производились эти репрессии и так далее. А это все можно сделать в музее. Более того, родственники пострадавших передали нам в нашу общину целый ряд реликвий, которые связаны с пострадавшими на Будском полигоне людьми. Но хотя некоторое время эта скрипка была у нас в храме, но достаточно странно, что скрипочка принадлежащий одному из священников, который подгиб на полигоне, находится в храме. Когда облачение находится в храме, это понятно. Или какие-то такие подобные предметы. Вот это все будет, это все будет, я скажу, скажу так, уже находится в музейной экспозиции. Потому что мы уже открыли несколько залов, музей еще не полностью сформулирован, но пять первых залов, они открыты для, доступны, для, скажем так, для посещения. And there was a question to them. I understand that question was directed to me. So I try to briefly answer that. Um, first of all, remember, the Dikir is the remembrance of God. And of course, what is in human memory, we cannot erase. But uh, there is always the, uh, in Islam the idea of, of forgive and, and then forget. Um, so they don't carry the memory from the past all the time because it's burden. It's a big burden. The memory is a burden. If we don't know how to deal with it, It can destroy us slowly and, and, and damage our, our psyche. Um, so, um, as far as the uh, tragedy in Bosnia, I'm, uh, I don't feel I'm, I have any rights to comment because it was too painful for, for people who suffered. But then again, I mean, this element of forgiveness, uh, one of the most important uh, aspects, attributes of God is uh, compassion and uh, forgiveness um, so uh, humans also should uh, try at least try to for, for, forgive because her forgiving is a healing effect uh, so if it is possible to forgive and forget it that's good if it's not then uh, we, we, we are in agony in continued agony so uh, that's all I can say to that. I hope that answers your question in case if not then I'm willing to Karina uh, Rzynska from Magellanian University. I've got a question for Rabbi Joshua Ellis about this very interesting idea of uh, releasing from the trauma. Uh, if I understood you well, uh, those like those temp uh, those temporary this wooden matzevot, right, uh, are placed in those unmemorialized uh, genocide sites uh, to help local inhabitants to release themselves from the trauma, if I understood you well. And my question is, uh, is they, like the objects, uh, are they the only um, like, uh, tool to uh, facilitate this process? Or do, do you, could you think about some other actions you may uh, Initiate to, to, to deal with it. Thank you very much. Um, so, the, th thank you for the question. The, the point of the Matze vote is uh, there are a few points. One is first, is first and foremost, is to mark the place so that it is, so that it, it is commemorated. It says in the, in the book of the prophets, I think it's Is Isaiyahu. I always confuse my prophets, I'm sorry. Uh, they talk about that, uh, that each person will have a Yad Vashem. A Yad is literally hand and name, but what it, uh, the memorial 
and, and your name will be remembered. Um, I, th I mean, there are many points. Part of it is just saving these places from oblivion. Um, and I think that's, the de that's kind of the point of all memory, especially of people. Uh, but certainly, certainly the point is, is to release trauma as well. Um, trauma can't be released if it's not recognized, right? It, otherwise, it just, it just festers and destroys. Um, uh, and the, the, we, um, from our tradition, we see that the, 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 the pattern is, is making a place, making ability to return to the traumatic event and in a, in a, in a, in next, in a, in a safer circumstance. Um, sometimes in the perspective of 80 years, it allows us to release it. The other tools we are working on, we have every one of these sites is on a website. We have a, a website called Zapomian, it's zapomian.org, uh, uh, where each of these sites is, is lo marked on a map with, direct, with link to Google Maps so you can get directions how to go there. Uh, and, the mo and, and linked to that are um, the, um, the various materials that we've gathered to, to determine what and where these places are. Uh, the research that we've done, the archival research, uh, testimonies, pictures if we have any. Um, the, we're, we're working on different ideas of how to make it a place, uh, an interactive place as well. Um, it's, we're, we're certainly still developing. Also the site right now is only, is only in Polish. We have to help to put in, the, to translate it to English into Hebrew as well. Uh, it is an ongoing process and it's, it's a learning process. Um, we need to mark these places for, for everyone involved. Um, how fast, how much, that, that we're still determining. It's, it's the, the, the situation is determining as well. Yes, uh, Katie Rousselet from, from France. Uh, do you remember any case of remembrance when you discussed the way of memorialization uh, with the representative of another religion? Uh, you, all of you spoke about uh, how you and your community uh, memorialize the, uh, the, the problems. Uh, the, uh, and do you remember a discussion between uh, your between the representatives and how did it happen? How did it I suppose that on the one hand, uh, every community has its own uh, uh, tradition of commemoration of uh, uh, dealing with, with the past. Uh, on the other hand, there is a kind of, uh, of knowledge on this experience. Uh, in the sense that uh, if there is any conference on reconciliation, on memory, uh, the, all religions will be represented there. So there is an exchange of, of the points of view. Also other uh, experiences and other traditions. Uh, I remember once um, in Stockholm, uh, I, and I think probably this will be tomorrow your experience, uh, there was uh, someone from South Africa who was talking on the process of, uh, the procedures of reconciliation in the country. And uh, in this uh, moment, they referred uh, also to animist tradition. So that the, the country is uh, in a great part a Christian country, but on the other hand, there are still animist communities, but also a, uh, animist traditions without any religion, in the sense that, that a symbol, this was working as symbols. So that uh, uh, we need also some signs of reconciliation and or these signs are already in our tradition, so everyone can uh, can understand this. Uh, or uh, we are inventing or, or finding outside those signs. Uh, but uh, mm, uh, mm, there is uh, also a kind of, of uh, 
of secular dealing with tradition and uh, commemoration because if you are coming from France, I, uh, uh, there's a wonderful book uh, by Secher uh, on Vendée with, with the title on, uh, from gender side to uh, the, uh, the um, genocide or memoricide, to memoricide. So that, uh, that when you have a kind of totalitarian uh, uh, power, they are trying also to have the power of the past and how people remember. And they are also fighting against the memory of uh, people. Uh, so uh, that's about the democratic France, so not about the Soviet Union. But this memory of, of the genocide in Vendée was totally uh, uh, forbidden in the country. There was no reference in any historical book for 200 years. Uh, uh, so that's also, in a certain sense, a secular tradition of dealing with memory and reconciliation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I think we, we from this um, uh, historical and scientific point of view, we know that uh, if there is no reconciliation, but only uh, something is forgotten, it's coming back. And uh, uh, that, that, that's why uh, um, thinking on the future, we have also to pass reconciled past to the next generation. But this is our responsibility to deal with the past and uh, today to let people live in a better future. Because if not, uh, that's a Spanish case, for example. They tried after Franco regime just to forget. And there's conflict till today. Uh, so that's that's uh, why it is so important. Thank you. Можно я еще добавлю к этому к вопросу более конкретно? Но в силу ряда причин обстоятельства территории захоронения в Бутово была передана русской православной церкви. Я сейчас не готов это достаточно длинный рассказ, чтобы не углубляться. И когда мы стали заниматься этой территорией, мы осознали о том, что для нас свято память не только православных христиан, которые лежат в этой земле, но память всех. И мы прекрасно осознали, что мы несем ответственность за сохранение этого места не только перед членами православной церкви, но и перед представителями других конфессий или вообще людей неверующих. И по инициативе общины храма в Бутове в 2000-х годах была проведена специальная научная конференция, на которой были приглашены представители разных конфессий с тем, чтобы они рассказали о тех традициях, которые имеются в их конфессиях по сохранению памяти вот, жертв таких катастроф, массовых катастроф и сохрани... мемориализации сохранения мест их захоронений. И на эту же конференцию приглашали, при... были приглашены представители э, скажем, светского э, министер... от Министерства культуры, которые занимались, ну, в, в частности, например, в Медно, представители музея Медного, где вот поляки были расстреляны в том числе с тем, чтобы услышать их как бы, точку зрения. И выработаны рекомендации на этой конференции, мы в нашей работе стараемся использовать. И надо сказать, в определенном ответом, вот именно то, что в Бутове лежат люди самых разных вероисповедований и разных мировоззрений, явился идея создания вот этого мемориала, в котором все, вне зависимости от их убеждений, их мировоззрений, указаны имена всех убиенных. И он сделан именно как светский, даже колокол, который висит в конце этого мемориала, он не несет 
обычных православных элементов в своем украшении. Это простой колокол, именно как колокол памяти, общий человеческий символ памяти. Alicia Turanovic, University of Warsaw. I have three questions to, to Professor Mazurkevich and one to Rabbi. One question, I mean, I'm really interested in the point you made that memorizing the crime, remembering about the crime is rather on the perpetrators and not the victims because the victims they remember anyway. And that's the fair point, I guess. But this, this process of memorizing on the side of perpetrators is very painful and challenging. So my question is, how do you see this in the context of Poland? Because the awareness that we have been, that the Polish people were victims is quite strong, right? How about on the side that there are also moments of being perpetrators? I'll just give you an example when I ask my students, what are the things Russians should apologize to Polish for? I can't make them stop talking, right? This one, this one. The, okay, well, how about the things uh, Polish people should apologize to Russians? What do you mean? This, this is provocation. So. How do you see this from this point of view? And then I will come to the second question, because you mentioned the great initiative, in my opinion, of this exchanging letters of, between Russian Orthodox Church and Polish Catholic Church, I mean the Episcopat and the visit of Patriarch Kirill in Poland. But in fact, a part of the comments which were afterwards, I'm, I'm talking about the press, but also you know, certain parties, it was quite critical, again, right? That it was maybe not the treason, but definitely this is not the right time. So my question would be, do you see, could you give an example, examples that this what happened, this initiative of two churches really changed something on the level of the believers? That the image maybe of Russia changed the head of Polish Catholics and I don't know, maybe vice versa. So these two questions. And to, to Rabbi, uh, you, you said at the end that it's getting really much more difficult in Poland to, to talk about memory and to commemorate things. I'm sorry if it's politically sensitive, but my question would be, was there a better moment to do it in Poland? And if, if so, is it just about politics and the government, or is it also some, I don't know, social processes? Because Pol Polish society is also changing. I don't know, transformation, and so many other processes uh, which are taking place. So what would be your, your opinion on that? Thank you. Concerning the, the, this question, who should commemorate? Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, quite easy to uh, remember uh, what the others did against us. And in this moment, when we commemorate the same things with Germans, uh, so uh, in, uh, we are not putting the Germans in the in a comfortable situation when we are saying, yes, but you should think on this and that you did this and that. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, when we look on, the, on those past crimes, not just as a part of Polish-German relationship, but as something which happened in the history of humans. So uh, that we, as humans, we are able to do this kind of things. It happened that Germans started. But why we should remember on this? Because this is something we are able to do. And in this sense, the, the memory uh, on this in a German culture is an important part of a human memory. And in this moment, if, if they remember this, no one will accuse them that you have forgot. You did it and you, you uh, you killed your own memory. Uh, but uh, we just did uh, a research on the youth in seven European countries, Germany included, uh, and we were surprised that 
uh, nearly 50% of the young Germans don't make a link between Nazism and Germany. Nazism is something which came from the outside, according to nearly 50% of the young Germans. Uh, who should take care for the, this knowledge of the youth in Germany? Poles, Russians, Czechs? No. That's the German responsibility. And uh, uh, this is a kind of, of nobleness. Uh, so in, in this sense, uh, this question, who should remember, is, is in my understanding, uh, important. Uh, and then, uh, concerning this, for example, Polish or Russian, relationship. Uh, you see, this, this process uh, between Poland and Germany started between churches. Uh, and finally, not in the, in the first moment, but finally, between Catholics on both sides. Uh, and there were common initiatives and so on. It's more difficult with Russia in this sense that on the other, one hand, there is a question concerning Catholic Orthodox relationship. When I was uh, uh, at Atras, uh, so the, I think this stopped to work. So when I, when I was at Mount Atras, uh, I was allowed to enter uh, only into the narthex to the church because for those Greeks mostly or Bulgarians I was not baptized. Uh, that's Catholic Orthodox relationship. And then you have Polish-Russian relationship and the whole history, and then you have the current policy, so that on the other side you have Putin, political reasons, and so on. Uh, and this is making extremely difficult this this process of reconciliation. So that if this would be only between churches, it would be much easier. But um, Mm, there is a, a part of the work we should do on our side, and there is a part Russians are doing on their side. So that if we are thinking on memorial, I think that this, these are Russians, uh, we are very grateful to them. And we, we, we are always talking on, with respect on them. But uh, for reconciliation, it's important the truth. So that we, our lesson is to, uh, to find the truth, what really happened. And for this reason, usually in the reconciliation process are organized truth commissions. So that there are people from both sides Sometimes with a kind of referee coming from the outside. I just met last week uh, bishops from Chile. Uh, sorry, not from, from Colombia. So there, there, there was this process of reconciliation going on now. And they, they said in the Truth Commission are American professors. Uh, just to make this dialogue between both groups possible. Uh, and we are just trying to discover the truth. For this you need, on the one hand, uh, you need uh, the goodwill on both sides, and the competence also. Uh, my friend who is a German historian told me that when, uh, there was, when a, in a certain moment it appeared a problem between Polish and German historians dealing with archives in Poznań. 
So both groups were coming, were going there, but uh, they read a totally different message. It appeared that uh, Germans were no, not speaking Pol Polish. In this sense, they read only half of the archive. And on this ground, they brought the books. So when they found this fact, they said, OK, so to deal with Polish-German relations, they both sides should speak both languages. And they started uh, to uh, the, 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 the rule that everyone during the meeting is speaking his mother tongue, and there is no translation. So that's, that's the competence needed. The goodwill, but also uh, to be able to, to, to discover the truth. Thank you. Um, so in terms of memory, so maybe I missed it a bit. Memory, on the one hand, I think memory, is, there's a very great danger to memory right now in Poland. Mem in terms of memorialization, it, the government now is actually one of the easiest to work with. Um, as, as it, it helps usually with the victims, if, if it's clear that the perpetrators uh, were German. But if it's an unambiguous story, it's the, the national government is, is, we have very few difficulties with. M the memory has become weaponized here. Right, IPN, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I tried to make this my, the most political thing I say. IPN is, right, they, they, they have a mission now, not just about educating, not just about the truth, or whatever that is. Um, memory has become, is, is, is a tool for, for crafting. Part of this has to do with the government, part of this has to do with, um, with worldwide trends, right? Make America Great is also about memory. Uh, incidentally, you know, according to, they did polls, when do people say America was great? Everyone's, the, the answer universally given, the 90% of, of respondents, when I was younger. <laughs> right. um, the m memory is, is in great danger, I feel now. And, and it seems to me, I, I'm no expert, I wasn't here in, in the early 2000s and the late 90s. From what I understand, there was a time when People were people here, and Central Europe in general, and in, in, in Europe in general, in the world maybe, but certainly specifically here, they were more open to uh, re-examining the past. Um, also, if you look in Russia right now, if you look at Stalin's uh, legacy now, as opposed to 20 years ago, right? He's he's back as one of the most popular uh, Russian leaders of all times, whereas 20 years ago it was much more discussed about his crimes. Um, it's, it's not a uniquely Polish uh, occurrence, but it does seem to me that we are in a time where um, memory is more mythology. Um, and this is, this is an accelerating trend. Uh, but on the other hand, when it comes to, for, for my purpose, for our purpose, memorializing has gotten actually, has gotten consistently easier. Thank you. Okay, uh, I, I, I would like very much to ask you one more question, uh, which is very important f f for me. Um, in general, we say life was easier in the past, and everybody repeats it, and the same does uh, Maurizio Halbach, uh, Pierre Nora, when he said there were milliers de memoir, means there was once upon a time, we all lived in memory, and everything was easy. And now, as you all stressed, everything is more complex. And my question to you, because uh, when we are, there is a huge sociological and anthropological literature describing um, fears, 
uh, of people, of believers. So on the one hand, they are believers. On the other hand, they are the members of the state, of the nation, and they have to deal. So they, they have the problem with their identity. You are on the opposite side. So you are representative of religions. You really know what you want to do. You, 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 you have your communities. You have, uh, you have law. But in the same time, you are members, members of civic society, uh, as we are, and you have the right to participate in it. And what I heard in many of your presentations, so uh, in uh, Pastor Thomas' presentation, uh, Father. Okay. And uh, uh, Rabbi Yoshua, it's uh, that you know you are making uh, mm, so you are making the projects. Your work doesn't concern only believers, but it is for a wider. So you don't in the time you know it was like the the, the Catholic Church, the Russian Orthodox Church should commemorize uh, Orthodox believers, Catholicly. Well their community, but now it changes. So it is what you said both, yeah? That, uh, you know, it is the, the project. In my opinion, your projects are, very, you know, they are religious, but are, they are also civic from this perspective as we understand. So you commemorate everybody, not without, you know, looking from which religion they, they, they come. So, and here come the problem because, uh, when some secular people are doing it, so we say yes, civic, civic uh, commemoration uh, for the human, for the civic society. But when you start to, to do it, so there is the question of, uh, about what it is, because your role in general it is to evangelize. Yeah, it is to 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 make in your community bigger, and now. So my question to you: What is the function of of the of this uh, of this uh, commemorative work you do? Because I, I see a kind, you know, you know, the, 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 this discrepancy. Yeah, you are both the, the the representative of religion, and you have some duties, and in fact, you should evangelize. But on the other hand, you are the members of civic society, as we all are, and you have the same. Right, as we all, as a member of this uh, of this society, to commemorate, but but still, how it is with you, yeah, and with the, with this approach uh, to to this, yeah. The word <laughs> evangelize. This is very special. What what is the meaning of this? Because our church uh, initiated initiated in, in the early 90s the idea of the memorial and the documentation center and some kinds of remembrance, the everyday one and the big remembering days in summer when the 13th of August, the day of the erecting of the wall and the 9th of November. And you know the 9th of November is getting very deep in the German history even in to this year. 38 with all the uh, circumstances of the pogrom against the Jewish population. And so this is uh, a public responsibility taken from our congregation as an idea. It was later on founded and paid by the state to hold on our former congregation house as the nowadays big documentation center with the director and the research uh, division and uh, an archive and all these things. It is uh, in, uh, and nowadays a foundation and an institution. And as you have as you have seen, the church was expelled and uh, it was an uh, empty room. But the decision was to let us there as people, as humans, as a uh, the the new chapel was built exact on the old ground to give an example maybe to give a picture for, for something from the gospel that you can begin a new way. This is um, a kind of a, a preach, a, of preaching. Not only the, the act of remembering, even our pure existence there. 
and we grow this field, we grow the garden, and we we uh, get together the people, and we even we commemorate the refugees, not only from the past, from today. From you have we we commemorate every month a one biography of a refugee from today, from Turkey, from Africa, from somewhere, in the same style as we do it every day in our chapel. And we do it outside of the chapel with a microphone, and this is a very public thing. And this is, for me, uh, the kind of being uh, or having a message. Yeah? This is our task, not only to grow our congregation. This is absolutely not realistic. <laughs> Я скажу так, что я оказался на Вудском полигоне не как священник, а как внук убиенного на этом месте священника Владимира Борцумова. И считал просто обязанность своей принять участие в сохранении этого места в вековечной памяти моего деда. И потом уже вот стал священником, возглавил общину Гутовскую как священник. И сейчас действительно, если меня спросить, кто я такой, я в первую очередь, я в первую очередь священник. И именно так себя воспринимаю. И это главное мое, так сказать, служение. Но если говорить вот о том аспекте, о котором вы задали вопрос, относительно того, что вот насколько эта работа, которая часто имеет не церковную форму, потому что в обязанности меня как настоятеля храма, естественно, не входит создание мемориального комплекса, создание музея или участие в работе каких-то организаций, комиссий, которые созданы теми или другими структурами, в том числе и правительственными. Я являюсь членом некоторых, нескольких комиссий или рабочих групп, которые занимаются вековечной памяти, созданных правительством разного уровня. Вот. Но я считаю, что вот эта работа, которая занимается наша община по созданию музея, по созданию мемориала, это как бы наше обращение, да, основанное на нашей христианской вере, наше обращение к современному обществу, которое, в общем-то, ушло, уходит в целом от Бога, от вообще понятия духовной жизни, с тем, чтобы напомнить им о Боге. И в... имеется много примеров, можно сказать, трагических, а с другой стороны, героических примеров в истории тех людей, которые пострадали на Будском полигоне, когда одни вели себя очень достойно во время следствия, а другие недостойно, именно из-за того, что одни оказывались верующими людьми и понимали, откуда, почему происходит это на них гонение, а другие просто не понимали. Это была их трагедия, и, к великому сожалению, нередко действительно теряли человеческий образ в этих испытаниях, которые пришлось ему пережить. И мы пытаемся это донести до наших современников. Скажу еще один момент, с моей точки зрения очень важный, который еще мало осознается, но вот тот опыт служения, который у меня есть на Бутовском полигоне, я с 1994 -го года. Так что уже более 20 лет нахожусь на этом месте. Это место и вообще память об пострадавших имеет, обладает удивительной объединяющей силой. И приходят люди действительно совсем других мировоззрений. И когда находишься с ними на Будском полигоне, происходит ощущение братства. Да, иногда происходит на Будском полигоне, происходили достаточно непростые разговоры, как, например, во время встречи с господином Сикорским, министром иностранных дел Польши. 
Хотя результатом этого разговора, непростого разговора, я скажу так, было достигнуто в общем, понимание источников этой, этих трагедий, которые, мы, которые пережил и жить народы Советского Союза и народ Польши. Мы действительно достигли какого-то внутреннего понимания. И это было очень важно, с моей точки зрения. И вот повторяю, что мы действительно, я действительно считаю, что тем, что мы занимаемся, это напоминание нашим современникам, уходящим от Бога, именно напоминание о Боге, о вечной жизни, о, духой, о духовной жизни. We have to be careful complaining on, on our time uh, because I remember that Plato complained that when people discovered the writing, this killed the memory. Because before it was necessary to learn the books by heart. We are not doing this. But still uh, we are dealing with, with, with memory. There is a phrase uh, How many times should I forgive to the one who offended me? Up to seven? Is this a secular or religious sentence? This is just from the gospel. But you know this because this was the question posed by St. Peter to Jesus. But someone who does not know who is Peter and who is Jesus understand the question. And in this sense, uh, when we are looking on the, on the culture, we can say Europe is created by Christianity, but today also in this sense that people understand what is the meaning of this sentence. Uh, uh, there is a, a famous uh, example. Uh, if uh, you are driving a car on the motorway and you uh, are a witness of, the, uh, of an accident, there is a duty to help this person, a legal duty. But, and you are not opposed to this. Is it not unjust? to oblige a person to stop a car because there is someone in the other one who had an accident? Why we do not rebel against this? Because this is just a parable of the good Samaritan, which became legal obligation in Europe. And this model coming from the Bible is so natural for everyone that the Muslims, the Jews, the, the atheists, they don't rebel against this law. They said, yes, it, it should be like this. So that's one of the ways how uh, religion is working also in the secular society. Not always directly using religious argument, but as, uh, as uh, the factors which cre are creating a sense, rights, some models of thinking, of acting, um, and uh, I think that this, this is important also to remember this. But uh, on the other hand, when we are thinking about the secular society, it doesn't mean that we think about a society composed out of atheists and agnostics. The secular society in Poland is in 85, 90% composed out of Christians. And then there are some Jews, there are some Muslims, there are some atheists. 
But this is the secular society. Uh, not only the, this small percentage of those who don't believe in God. So a, when the secular society is acting, the motivation can be strictly religious, but then don't refer publicly in this action to, to religion. But if we would ask why you did this, it might be that this person will justify this referring to the gospel, to the Torah, to the Quran, or, or to a certain part of culture which is strictly rooted in religion. And still this is a secular action. So uh, I think that, that uh, Mm, it, it, it's, it's very important to see uh, also religion as a normal mm, element of, of, of life, of human beings. And sometimes this is, uh, religion is present through the religious institutions, sometimes through just religious people, sometimes through some models of culture uh, rooted in religious traditions. So this would be, by the way, of uh, summing up, because <laughs> the meeting is almost over. So uh, evangelizing is actually is not uh, very much in the Islamic spirit. It's, uh, it's a better form of evangelizing is basically, basically to provide a very good example of good character. And that the whole of Islam is just one struggle to become a better person than we were before. Um, as since the, um, okay, when we talk about forgiveness, well, in Islamic science, the, the, the true and the only forgiver is God. And we must not forget that. Um, a Muslim should be a child of a moment and not someone who dwells too much on the past. Past is important if it gives some lessons to our life. Otherwise, the intellect that is used to dwell in the past is, according to Islamic um, theologians, not in intellect, not properly, proper, pro properly utilized. Uh, one word about martyr, uh, um, just a couple of words to expand the concept of martyr, because perhaps some of you don't know. Uh, a martyr is, or shahid, is, is, is someone who dies uh, not in defending of faith, uh, but also defending his or her own family. Uh, a woman who delivers a baby and, and dies, she's also a martyr, a shahid. And uh, all shahids go straight to heaven, martyrs. So mar martyr is not the one who is only fighting for the cause of religion. No, absolutely not. And, and, and even car accident, someone who died in car accident is also considered a martyr because he has no opportunity to rectify his or her life in the normal course of life. So uh, here and now is the, the, the most important thing and, and a Muslim should not commit his more time to people who are dead than rather people who are alive because the greatest responsibility we have to people who are still alive and in our families and uh, people who live around us. So forgive and forget. If you forgive and don't forget, then might as well to forget it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to slightly alter the question or alter the perspective. The, the dichotomy between religious and secular, it's a Greek idea. It's not, the, the rabbis, our tradition doesn't really like it very much. We don't really play that game. Rather, we dichotomize between chokim and mishpatim. 
between uh, laws that have logical, uh, inferable reasons, which are called mishpatim, um, and chukim, laws that we don't understand. The most famous example given by uh, the, the 11th century commentator Rashi is uh, kashrut, uh, kosher food, right? I can't eat a pig. I don't know why. It looks like a nice animal, but I can't eat it. Uh, so there are mish, there are chukim, things that we don't understand. When it comes to this realm of of memori of of of, com of protecting and commemorating and memorializing the dead, to me that's that's not a mis that's not a mystery. That's about the basic dignity of of humankind of of all people, which is I believe the fundament of most certainly of 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 the Jewish vision of, of what we're here, of, of our mission in the world, I, uh, I, I would dare to say of most all religions. Uh, as such, it's not, it, it, it's, the, the goal is, 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 is our, gen the, the goal of, this, of these specific projects are in line with our general goal. There is very much a tension between dealing with the living and dealing with the dead, and it's uh, it's it is ongoing. It is uh, especially in terms of resources, uh, and it's n it's a balance that we're. St I, I feel the, the 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 more I feel that I fail to achieve that balance, the better I feel about it. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone for this very exciting and very inspiring talks and uh, your ideas. Thank you for sharing your ideas and time with us. And uh, for the audience, sorry that we really took uh, so much of your time, but I hope that you enjoyed it and you had some ideas for your future research. And now I, um, we would like to invite you all to the dinner, uh, which is uh, at the same place where we had the lunch. So thank you, and I hope that tomorrow I will see everyone <laughs> fresh and ready to work again. Thank you.